This is a brief video on anxiety, OCD, PTSD, and related psychiatric disorders. We're going to be talking about psychiatric disorders that are related to nervousness, rumination, and related somatic complaints. We're going to be talking about diseases that are listed on the left here. And this is a general picture of a person expressing anxiety that can be related to any and all of these disorders. Let's get started with generalized anxiety disorder, sometimes abbreviated GAD. The prevalence of GAD is 5 to 10%, and it occurs twice as often in women than men. Generalized anxiety disorder is essentially excessive worrying and anxiety for at least six months. So that's one of the criteria for it. People typically worry about school, grades, jobs, uh, how much money they have, relationships they have, life events, and other parts of life. Worry about anything and everything. The pathophysiology is essentially a disrupted, a disrupted functional connectivity of the amygdala and its processing of fear and anxiety. Um, the amygdala is a part of the brain involved in processing fear and anxiety, as that definition implies, and it's shown in that image on the right there. To be diagnosed with a generalized anxiety disorder, you need to have at least three of the following symptoms. Restlessness, easy tiring, problems concentrating, irritability, muscle tension, and problems with sleep. These symptoms, like many of the other diseases on this list, need to interfere with your daily functioning for diagnosis. Treatment for GAD can be psychotherapy, like cognitive behavioral therapy, CBT, as well as pharmacotherapy, SSRIs, SNRIs, buspirone, and short-term benzodiazepines. Um, you never want to prescribe benzos for life, but for a short-term fix, they might be appropriate. And you'll see that many of these treatments are the same for all of these diseases, the same psychotherapy and the same pharmacotherapy. So we'll see this list um, quite a bit. Next up is specific phobias. Specific phobias have a lifetime prevalence of over 10% also more prevalent in women than men, two to one ratio. Specific phobias are an irrational fear of a specific object, place, situation, or concept that needs to, at least, that needs to occur for at least six months. Oftentimes, the fear in a specific phobia is described as being out of proportion to an imminent threat. So a fear of spiders, for instance, um, elicits a response that's way out of proportion to the actual threat that that spider poses to a person. The fear, again, needs to interfere with daily functioning in society. The exposure to whatever object, place, situation, or concept elicits immediate fear, and removal of that object, place, situation, or concept reduces the anxiety almost immediately. Fear in specific phobias might have developed from related trauma. Perhaps somebody had a near drowning accident and is now afraid of large bodies of water. That'd be an example of fear of water that developed from related trauma. Social phobia is one subcategory of specific phobias that involve fear of embarrassment in a public situation. Similar, but not quite the same, is agoraphobia, which is fear of public places due to the lack of the ability to escape. Um, these people essentially are afraid of unsafe environments. So those are two specific phobias that are worth knowing. Fear of embarrassment, social phobia, and fear of unsafe environments due to the lack of ability to escape, agoraphobia. Treatment for specific phobias are CBT, and also some scheduled meds like SSRIs and SNRIs can help. You can also prescribe meds to be taken as soon as a patient has an episode of intense fear, and that can be beta blockers or benzodiazepines. But again, you don't want to schedule benzodiazepines for a long term. Next disease is separation anxiety disorder. This is an excessive anxiety regarding separation from home or from people to whom an individual has a strong emotional attachment. In children, it's separation anxiety disorder when it occurs for over four weeks. In adults, it needs to occur for over six months to be separation anxiety disorder. Separation anxiety may include anxiety, fear, and distress when separated, reluctance to leave home, work, or school, or worry about harm to the attachment figure. So a child that is overly worried about their mom getting hurt 
uh, would be a manifestation, could be a manifestation of separation anxiety disorder. And again, symptoms need to cause dysfunction in that person's daily life. Again, treat with CBT, family therapy, and possibly SSRIs. Similar anxiety during normal child development occurs physiologically, and this is normal. This is not pathologic. Um, this includes stranger anxiety that occurs at six months in the development of a child. A child begins to fear people that do not look familiar or strangers. And separation anxiety normally occurs at one year in a child's development. A child begins to worry about being separated from mom or dad or whatever other attachment figure. Next up is panic attacks. Panic attacks have a prevalence of 4%, uh, also more common in women than men. Panic attacks are sudden periods of intense fear that may include palpitations, sweating, shaking, shortness of breath, numbness, or feeling that something bad is going to happen. Essentially intense fear. You need to have at least one of these attacks to be diagnosed with panic attacks, and that makes sense. And because you have these attacks and you've had them in the past, you have a constant worry about recurrence of these attacks. Other symptoms might manifest in panic attacks, and this includes trembling, unsteadiness, depersonalization, palpitations, and even pain in the abdomen or chest. It's important to rule out medical etiologies when trying to diagnose panic attacks. You want to be able to rule out hyperthyroidism, atrial fibrillation, pheochromocytoma, and drug use, including use of amphetamines and sympathomimetics um, to ensure there is no medical etiology and that a person is actually having a psychiatric panic attack. Treatment for panic, attack, panic attacks is similar. You could use psychotherapy like CBT. You can also use pharmacotherapy. Um, SSRIs are most commonly used. You can also use benzodiazepines as a short-term solution. And again, same common theme. You don't want to prescribe benzos for uh, long term, people can get addicted and require more and more of them. So benzos can be a short term fix. Somebody pops a Xanax when they feel a panic attack coming. Next up is OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder. Prevalence here is two to three percent, um, equal between men and women. Obsessive compulsive disorder is composed of obsessions and or compulsions, and we'll be defining both of those. Obsessions are recurrent thoughts that persist despite trying to ignore them. And compulsions are explicit rituals that either reduce anxiety or that patients feel they have to perform. So if you have one or both of these, you might have obsessive compulsive disorder. OCD is comorbid with many other psychiatric disorders, especially some that we're talking about here. Many of the anxieties, depression, bipolar, and OCPD. So oftentimes people have OCD with other disorders. Um, quick note, how to differentiate obsessive compulsive disorder from obsessive compulsive personality disorder is that one of them is egocentonic and the other one is egodystonic. Egocentonic means that it feels good, means that you're okay with yourself um, when doing that. That's OCPD, obsessive compulsive personality disorder, is egocentonic. OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, is not egocentonic. Um, you don't feel good about it. You don't want to constantly wash your hands um, every time you use the bathroom. You don't want to have to wash your hands 20 times in a row. You don't want to have to check the locks 50 times before leaving the house. These are things that disturb your daily life, and it's not egocentonic. So that's a quick differentiator between OCD, not egocentonic, and OCPD, which is egocentonic. Treatment for OCD is similar to the others, psychotherapy, including CBT, and SSRIs, um, as well as one tricyclic antidepressant, clomipramine, is shown to be a little more effective, but primarily SSRIs and CBT. There are some other disorders related to OCD. Um, these might be like a more specific um, type of OCD. This includes body dysmorphic disorder, which has a high prevalence in women, um, also higher in patients that are um, prominent at derm clinics or cosmetic surgery patients. In body dysmorphic disorder, people have perceived flaws in their physical appearance, and they often act upon those flaws. 
excoriation disorder or compulsive skin picking is another OCD related disorder. This can present like we saw in that picture on the previous slide. Let's go back to that real quick, where a patient has all these lesions all over their skin where they picked their skin. Um, and again, that's an ego dystonic uh, OCD disease. That is not something that a person wants to do. They feel like they have to pick their skin. Maybe they feel like they're infested with bugs, um, but that's excoriation disorder. Next is hoarding as an OCD related disorder. In hoarding, a patient cannot discard their possessions regardless of the value of their possessions, which largely leads to them accumulating trash. Um, and you can treat hoarding with specialized CBT. Trichotillomania is a hair pulling disorder. Um, you can see hair loss like you see in that picture on the right here. Um, person pulled out their hair uh, in a specific area and it leads to showing of the scalp on their head, trichotillomania. You can treat that again with specialized CBT, with habit reversal training, SSRIs, and some atypical antipsychotics might be useful here too. So these are diseases that are related to OCD, um, sometimes thought of as more specific variations of OCD. PTSD is the next disease we're talking about. This is a mental disorder occurring after exposure to trauma, such as sexual assault, warfare, other types of violence, and traffic collisions. Um, symptoms characteristic of PTSD include increased reactivity, irritability, difficulty concentrating, hypervigilance, exaggerated startle reactions, and difficulty with sleep. People with PTSD might avoid triggers of their symptoms. They might know that something triggers them, like loud noises or uh, perhaps a gush of water or being splashed. Symptoms in PTSD must last for at least one month. Similar to PTSD, you're kind of the short-term version of PTSD is acute stress disorder. This uh, is a PTSD-like condition with similar symptoms, similar avoidance of triggers, um, except that the trauma occurred less than one month ago and the symptoms have been lasting for less than one month. So oftentimes acute stress disorder evolves into PTSD after one month following the trauma. Treatment for PTSD is psychotherapy, again, um, CBT, specifically exposure therapy and cognitive processing therapy. Pharmacotherapy can, again, also be helpful, specifically SSRIs and SNRIs. You can also use prozosin to treat nightmares specifically. That's an alpha blocker that could be used to treat one of the symptoms, nightmares of PTSD. Adjustment disorder is the last disease we'll be talking about. This is a very common disorder and occurs in up to 20% of people, uh, often treated in the outpatient setting. Patients are unable to cope with stress or a major life event. Symptoms of adjustment disorder include loss of interest, crying, feelings of hopelessness. Um, oftentimes, some of the symptoms you'll see in major depressive disorder. Symptoms typically occur within three months of the stressor, such as moving to a new town or getting a new job or losing your job. Um, and the symptoms should resolve by six months after that stressor. Symptoms resolve when the patient finally adapts to that new situation, finally gets another job or gets another girlfriend or adjusts to living in Chicago or whatever the initial stressor was. Sometimes acute or sometimes adjustment disorder is called situational depression. Adjustment disorder can generally be treated with supportive therapy. You can consider temporary medications, um, especially for some of the symptoms like insomnia. You can tell them to take melatonin or anxiety, depression. You might give SSRIs for a bit of the time, but usually supportive therapy is all that's needed if there's a very um, very targetable stressor, a very obvious stressor that's causing the person distress with adjustment. This has been a short video on anxiety, PTSD, OCD, and related psychiatric disorders. I hope this was helpful and thank you for listening.